as was mentioned uh, multiple times today, we know that today is Mother's Day. Maybe you've always checked social media and seen, you know, different Mother Day posts and things of that nature. My daughter, uh, one of my daughters the last couple of years has asked, asked me, you know, why there's no Brothers or Sisters Day <laughs> or Children's Day. And I apparently have not convinced her in my answer, you know, that, hey, you know, this all the, the whole calendar is, is centered around children, you know. It's every day is Children's Day. You got your birthdays and this and that, Christmas, all this is centered around you guys. Mothers and fathers need, you know, or it's, it's you know, we, there's a day that needs to be celebrated, you know. They don't get a day off, so they should at least get one day. But that has not been, I didn't convince her good enough because she always asks about it. But, you know, we're, we're blessed, and I'm blessed personally to have so many great moms in my life that all model some unique characteristic of godliness. Um, you know, mother-in-law, my wife, my birth mom. And my mother, I'm thinking about my, my birth mom, is a testament, and I've told you this before, of just stubborn faith in God and just an example of just faithful praying with expectation. In faith. She told me the story later, but when I was, uh, I mean, I remember the situation, but I didn't know the, all the events of her praying and things of that nature until I got a little bit old, older. But when I, when I was three, and I don't remember all, everything when I was three, but I do, there are certain traumatic experiences that I do remember. When I was three, I remember waking up in an ambulance <laughs> and then being in the hospital for a week. And the reason why I woke up in an ambulance, the, the, the thing that all I remember before is just being very, very hot and things of that nature, but then I woke up in an ambulance, but the, the thing that happened in between there, apparently I had a very difficult, hard seizure. And I got rushed to the, to the hospital. I think we, we think the God has never tied it down as a reaction to a certain type of medicine. But while I was in the hospital, the doctors told my mom that most likely... I would struggle with Caesars the rest of my life um, from what they're looking at. My mom prayed and prayed. And by God's grace, you know, Lord knows what the future holds. That has not been the case at all. That was the only Caesar I've ever had. One of the biggest impacts to me spiritually my mom had on me was her persistent, faithful, confident prayers of faith to God. I used to be like, man, why is she praying for this ridiculous thing? It's never going to happen. No way God was going to provide that. No way we're going to get that deal or this, this house situation. And my mom would just keep praying. She would bring me along, even though I was not in the mood or thought it was ridiculous, and she would have me pray with her. Many times we saw God answer big requests. Sometimes his answer was, this is not my will right now. And even if the answer was a no, it never stopped my mom from confidently and consistently praying for the next big request, totally convinced beforehand that it was going to come to pass. What is it that motivated and encouraged my mom to continue to pray, no matter how big or ridiculous the request may be? What is it that encourages us? or anyone, to persevere in our prayers. You know, my mom left a, you know, she's definitely not, you know, she's a great lady, but not perfect. But she, she forever left an impression on me about God and prayer. But even with that great example, church, guess what? I get discouraged in praying for things sometimes. I get discouraged in prayer. What was a burden that I prayed for often, I eventually, at least practically, take my foot off the gas in prayer. My fervency subsides at times. And for different reasons, I'm not as persistent. I get discouraged in praying for something. And for honest, many of us, maybe all of us, are like that sometimes. You know, in, in, our, in, our, in our text here, we saw the pattern of prayer in the first four verses. 
Jesus' first prayer lesson, he gave us important themes, right, of what we should include in our prayer, like, you know, uh, describing holiness to his name. And praying for the advance of his kingdom, that his kingdom would come. And for our daily provision, and for forgiveness of sins, and for protection from sins. But, for many of us, and like the disciples, what's hard is continuing in prayer. You know, what's the point, we may ask. Sometimes if there's nothing tangible that we can do, like, you know, there's something, you know, praying for something, and there's nothing that we can actually physically do. Sometimes, we might not admit this, subconsciously we're thinking, man, we're discouraged. Man, all we can do is pray. As if that's like, that, that's not going to do much. Maybe we've been praying for this for years, and I still struggle with that. Or this person still is the way that they are. This situation is still messed up. What's the point of just keep praying? Well, our text, Jesus gives the answer of why we must persevere in prayers to God. Jesus provides compelling motivation and encouragement for God's children to keep running to him in prayer. So the first four verses of Jesus' prayer series gives a pattern of prayer. These verses gives us motivation to keep praying. Let's look at our text. We see a friend with a midnight crisis here. Look at verses uh, five here. It says, and he said to them, which of you has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within. Do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are in bed are, are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. We're in Luke chapter 11, verse 5. You missed that earlier. Jesus here loves to teach with stories, right? And with vivid illustrations that makes his point clear. And Jesus, being a good teacher, he always paints a picture in a way that would re resonate with his audience. Jesus is like, who, who's among you? If you have a friend on a long journey, come to your house at midnight and you don't have food for him, would go to a friend's house in the neighborhood, bang on the door at midnight, asking him to give you some food so you can feed your friend at your house. Most of us are like, man, that's crazy, right? Can't this wait until morning? Why is this such a big deal? You know, we probably said, tell that friend better get some sleep, right? And we'll handle it in the morning. But remember, you know, why is this such a crisis? <laughs> remember, uh, hospitality is huge in that culture, especially in small, uh, small communities. Remember Martha stressing out about having to fix Jesus' uh, uh, food when he came over. A lot of that stress was driven by this kind of hospitality culture. Your household was known in a bad way if it was not a place of hospitality. That was assumed. One of the basic parts of hospitality, even for those who didn't have much money, right, is you had food for guests when they came over. Basically, uh, bread. This was this basic. And, you know, that first century, and that first century of Palestine at that time, food was not readily available as it is today. There was no, like, neighborhood Walmarts and corner stores and gas stations open all night. All the bread had to be baked for that day. Again, it was a cultural requirement to be a good host to a visitor. And this is a friend. So much so that the community was also responsible to help. That required food. So if this situation happened to you, you have to choose between inconveniencing someone in the middle of the night or be known as a house that could not take care of a guest and a friend at that. Not only was it a bad look on your household, but really the community that you lived in. Now, now even with a culture like that, it would still be extreme for someone to come to your house in midnight talking about, hey, I'm out of food, and a guest showed up. I was just thinking, my thing is like, man, did he just leave the guest at his house at midnight and leave, <laughs> leave the guy there? Anyway, I was just thinking that I was reading there. But it would still be extreme. That's why Jesus is like, basically, which one of you is basically that bold and reckless enough that if you were in the same situation would do the same thing? 
Again, this was the cultural expectation if you were rich or poor. And I had some type of house here. The family in this situation basically had the whole family with children living in, you know, like a studio apartment, basically. So imagine like a house with like one main room where the, you know, sleeping and living places all in the same place. The whole family would sleep on a raised platform at the end of, uh, at one end of such room, possibly with animals on the, you know, on the floor level. So even if the homeowner does not want to be, uh, you know, uh, does want to help the rude midnight friend, you know, if he doesn't, he's going to wake everybody up in the, you know, in the process of trying to meet this guy's needs, trying to get the bread stepping over things, you know, and opening up things and you know, getting things out. The whole process would have woke his children, his wife and children up. So he has a wife. Like I said, he has children, maybe even toddlers and babies. It's the middle of the night. Parents know the struggle of getting children to sleep, hoping that they don't wake them up, that they don't wake up, because if they do wake up, you ain't getting sleep. It's only natural that the friend that he comes to is first like, nah, right? My door is shut. The children are asleep here with me. I can't help you. It was hard, you know, hard enough to get these kids to sleep in the first place. Then if I wake you up and my wife has to get up, my wife going to kill me. Now I ain't helping you, right? I love you, bro, but I see you at synagogue. You better move on, right? It makes sense. All of us would have a natural type reaction. But the friend does not stop. He keeps on knocking harder and longer. Hey, you can't leave me hanging out here, bro, right? What will people say about my, my household, this, what, this community, if I can't feed my guests, my friend? Hey, I'm just going to stay out here all night. Eventually, the neighbors are going to start waking up, right, turning on their lamps. Like, what is that noise at Levi's and Naomi's house, right? You know, what's going on over there? Look at verse 8. Jesus says, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is a friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. His friend, despite the huge inconvenience, grants his friend's request. Why? Because he won't go away. He's knocking loud in the middle of the night. Jesus says because of his, the word here is impudence. The word here means like lack of restraint, really shamelessness. I think the, the most updated NIV translates it shameless audacity, I saw. Does not care if it make, he makes a scene or how ridiculous it makes him look, he's willing to put it all out there to get what he wants, to get what he needs. The shameless boldness is the, uh, boldness is the idea. Kids can be sometime like this, you know. I, I remember uh, even at the, the soccer game yesterday, you know, my kid just seeing some, some, some lady with snacks. They ain't playing that game. Oh, can I have some? You know, it's like, no, you don't be asking them for that. You don't, no, that's not ours, right? You know, I told you an example of my friend in college asking every girl in, in the dining cabin, you know, to artist series. And then the person would say, the girl would say no, and he'd go to the next girl, like right next to her. Like it was just like, had no shame. You know, the shameless sometimes can be a good thing, sometimes it can be a bad thing. You, all of us know people who really don't have a filter or some type of shame level in the type of request they ask, or when they ask it, or how they ask, or how big is it. Sometimes salespeople can be like this, you know? You know, so I worked for UPS, and I was, a, you know, pretty much a sales rep. You know, sometimes people, you know, call, and, you know, trying to get them to stop shipping FedEx and ship UPS, and the person's like, hey, you know, it's not a good time. My mother died and things of that nature, all right? It'd be crazy for me to be like, oh, I'm sorry about that, but... How are you shipping flowers to your mother's funeral? You know, it's like that would be that would be crazy, a crazy, reckless shamelessness, you know, to do that. The point here is that <coughs> oh, excuse me. Why for, for let me ask you this. Why is Jesus giving this illustration? Well, look at verses eight and nine. Or sorry, uh, verses nine. Says, I tell you, ask and it will be given, and t given, uh, be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. 
Why is Jesus giving this story? To encourage his disciples to persevere boldly in prayer. Keep knocking and God will answer. Keep seeking, you'll find it. If a friend inconveniences, a friend who's in, greatly inconvenienced answers you at midnight, how much more will the Father answer those who continue to come to him in prayer? In many of Jesus' parables, including this one, there's often either a comparison or a contrast going on between the character and the parable and God or, or, or who God or Christ is. Sometimes the point is that if this is true about this person in this story, how much more true is it about God? And the point here is that if a friend is disturbed and greatly frustrated at midnight and eventually will give to the shameless, stubborn request of his friend, keep on asking, how much more will God, who is never annoyed by the request of his children and is infinitely compassionate, respond to those who confidently, with reverent but shameless boldness, knocking at his door in prayer. Look at verse 9 again. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will be fine. Knock and it will be open unto you. Ask, seek, find. These are like actions and commands. In the original language, these are, these are commands that are actually read as like continual actions. So the, the, the sense here, if you're like, in the original, is really like, keep on asking and, he, and, uh, and, and he will answer. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened unto you. Boldly keep on keeping on with the expectation that God is at the other side of that door. God is the one you're asking. God is the one that you're seeking and asking with the expectation that he will answer you. Who here has worked for a small, medium, or maybe a you know, bigger company? Anybody work for a company at all? University? Anybody work anywhere where you had some levels of hierarchy? I mean, not our young ones. Most of us elders have. How many of you have ever went to the CEO of that company, like the CEO's office, and just made a bold request? You don't have to raise your hand. Just went to his or her office. How many of you just kept on coming until you got them, right? Just got into their office. What about how many of you ever looked, you know, they weren't responding to your office request, so you just looked them up on Google and just showed up at their house, your CEO. Like, hey, you know, I couldn't get you at your office, your phone, whatever. Maybe, you know, they weren't at the house and you just saw them out with their family. And you just ran up on them like, hey, you know, this is your kids, okay. But hey, I, I was thinking these reports need to be approved and I want to, you know, make sure you got that, all right? Any of you guys do that? Nah, all right? What, y'all don't care about moving up at the corporate ladder? That's what you're supposed to do, just kidding, all right? Seriously, none of us would do, would do that, right? We wouldn't even do that to our immediate manager, <laughs> let alone the CEO. Church, do you realize that you are, the, you are the child of the one who spoke this world into existence, who upholds all things by the word of his power, whose understanding is unsearchable, but, but because of Christ's work on your behalf, you can run boldly to him and find grace and mercy at your time of need. You can confidently and reverently but shamelessly keep running to him, and you are encouraged to do so. You know, some commentators and preachers, I believe, get the central point wrong here or emphasize too much the wrong thing. They elevate the persistence of the person to such a degree to, as if there's like some special power and persistence in and of itself. Keep knocking on the door until he answers you. There's power and persistent prayer. You just have to keep on badgering God until you get his decision, uh, attention. God wants to see how hard you pray, how much you plead and agonize until he answers you. You need to be like this shameless friend, right? And keep on beating down God's door until he just has to answer you. There's power and persistent prayer, amen? That Mike can preach, but it misses the point. If persistence is just emphasized, some people are left with maybe if they have, you know, they have not prayed hard enough, long enough, they haven't agonized enough, they, you know, they not look, you know, not enough veins are in their forehead as they pray, right? If their prayers are not answered, God's just testing me to see how hard and consistent I'm going to can pray. 
For many people who prayed for loved ones to be delivered from cancer, and then they died. Or they see, they're praying for Christians and, uh, you know, for protection of, of Christians, and they get persecuted, and maybe they get killed. You know, people eventually get discouraged with, the app, with an application like that because they've been praying very hard, very sincerely. Either it doesn't seem like nothing has happened, or what they want doesn't happen. And they get discouraged, and they give up. It's not that you are persistent, but why you, it's not that uh, there's power and persistence, but why you are encouraged to boldly be persistent in prayer. That's the point. The power is not in persistence in and of itself. The key is believing and embracing the nature of God to whom you are persistently praying to, that he will answer you. That's why you keep coming be, and knocking and praying, because you know who's on the other side of the door. He's nothing like that irritated friend at midnight. That has to be battered until he says, okay, okay. No, God wants to answer you. God wants to hear you. He does not just have the power and resources to answer your request. He has the disposition and strong desire to. God doesn't get irritated, frustrated, upset with you for coming to him at any time of the day in any situation. You can't wake him up because he never sleeps. You can't ruin his lunch break. You can't disturb his personal time with family because you are family. This persistence is also a display of faith that you believe your father hears and will answer you. For you to give up praying shows that you either don't want it that much or you're not confident that who you're praying to will do anything. That maybe you think God does not care a, a much about answering your request. Maybe you have equated maybe the amount of time of your, you've been praying um, and that prayer been unanswered with God's apathy towards your request. Maybe you think you're not spiritual enough for God to really hear you or answer you. You're not confident that God will uh, hear your prayers or answer you. Persistent perseverance in prayer demonstrates your faith in God, of a God who does and wants to answer the prayers of his children. Look at verse 10. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. This is not saying that everyone who is asking is going to receive everything that they get, no matter what, no matter what you ask for. But... Don't expect it to receive it if you don't ask. James says it like this, you have not because what? You ask not. Don't expect to find if you don't seek, you know? You know, sometimes children, my children, but other children like this, you know, I've been like this, oh, I can't find such and such. Where have you looked? Well, uh, well, that's why you can't find it. You're not even looking. You just want me to do it? If it's a spiritual need or if it's for yourself, Pray and expect God to answer. If it's a material need for yourself or others, pray and expect God to answer. Jesus says that part of his pattern was, you know, for daily bread, for sustenance, for provision. Pray and expect God to answer. Whatever the ask, bring it to your Lord in prayer. It, it, the answer may not be, this is not my will at this time, but he always gives us what we need and what is best when we go to him in prayer. Listen, there are things in your life that God desires and wants to do that he won't do until you pray. There are things in the life of this church that God wants to do that he won't do unless we pray. If you think everything's going to happen the way it's supposed to, no matter if you pray or not, you have a really faulty understanding of the theology of prayer. There are things that God will do, even spiritual, right, that are at his heart. They're not going to happen until we start praying. Jesus tells his disciples who couldn't cast out a demon, uh, uh, he's like, hey, some things are not going to happen without prayer and fasting. You know, we have examples of this in Scripture. Paul commends a papyrus, right? Why was he commended to Colossians Church? Because the, the, Paul says he was always struggling on their behalf in his prayers. Man, what a testament. 
This is the pattern of Jesus. Jesus prayed all night on the mountain before choosing his disciples. He prayed often at other times that the, that the devil would not have them, right? That God would protect them. You see him praying at the Garden of Gethsemane, right? He is actually interceding for you right now. He never stopped interceding on your behalf uh, to the Father in prayer. Again, this is not that, uh, because you have to change God's mind, make God do what he doesn't want. No, he passionately wants to, uh, to, 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 to hear you and answer you. And Jesus' next illustration makes that expression clear, but bold, confident prayer is a demonstration of your faith in him and, and that you are expecting him to answer. And you are consumed with his desire that he will answer. Again, we're, we're persistent in prayer, not that we're trying to make God uh, do what he doesn't want to do, but no, we are faithful in prayer because we're convinced that God wants to answer us. That's who he is. And like I said, the second illustration, I, I really think, drives that heart home, that point home of why you should keep asking. Look at, um, and God uses another kind of explicit contrast example between earthly fathers and your heavenly fathers. Look at verses uh, 11 here and 12. It says, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, he will instead of a fish give a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, he will give a scorpion. Now that's crazy, right? Can you imagine? This is, you know, son comes to, hey, daddy, I want some of that fried fish. Can you please make, I'm hungry. Can you make me some of that fried catfish? Oh, I got you, son. And instead of making him some of that fish, I give him a deadly snake, and it's not a joke, right? Not like, oh, just kidding, I got the fish right here. No, I give him a snake. People will be like, man, that's cruel, you know? Or he's after, man, like, oh, I love your, your, your omelets. You make me some of that cheesy, meaty omelet that you make. And he's starving. Maybe he's been working all day. Oh, I got you. And instead of an omelet, cheesy omelet, that he can smell in his mind, I give him a, a poisonous scorpion, or I don't know if they're you know, poisonous, whatever. I give him some scorpion, right? That would be crazy. Even unsaved people in every culture, in every religion, right? Atheist, Muslim. Buddhist, Christian, that, that's unheard of as a pattern, right? You know, I've, you know, I've actually pranked uh, my, uh, my oldest daughter with a, like a like fake spider under a pillow, and, saw, and that was funny. But yeah, that, that would, <laughs> nobody would do, go to this level. I don't think so, right? Earthly unsaved fathers would sacrifice themselves for their children. So many mothers that are not even saved and all, again, agnostic, different religions give up careers, dreams that their children can have what they want. My mom is saved, but again, she's, she's not perfect, right? Just like us, but my mom, you know, you know, six boys, right? And for Christmas, she would work, extra, she's already working two jobs, but she would work extra shifts, pick up other jobs, just to save up to give us stuff that we didn't need, like Nintendo 64s and stuff like that. Work, work her tail off to provide so we can have a, 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 Chris, a, a Christmas that we don't deserve. You, you guys know of maybe your own parents or other parents who, who sacrifice so much. Maybe they're not an example of perfect Christianity, but when you look at their testimony of their fatherhood and their motherhood, you see a lot of sacrifice, right? Even like gangsters, mobsters, cult leaders, killers, dictators, just straight up evil people, most of them are very good to their children. They give them the world. They actually try to sometimes justify their behavior based on doing this for my kids, right? And even them, they can just get done killing somebody. They can see somebody, see a father giving a snake instead of some food, and they'd be like, man, that, that's a bad guy, right? This is, not, this is unheard of even for evil people. So even fathers love to grant, even if earthly fathers love to grant the request of their children, how much more does your father want to give and answer his children? Look at verse 13, though. Look at verse 13. 
If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Matthew writes in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uses a very similar story here, but he ends it with, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Luke says, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Why does Jesus say that here? Well, the greatest gift God gives to his disciples is himself, the Spirit of God. Our greatest need, even as believers, is more of God himself, to know and experience him more by the Spirit. God will always grant and is desirous to offer his presence and intimacy with his children. We should be praying that God would show us more of himself, that we would experience more of him and know more of him relationally through the spirit. Some of you might be disappointed here. Man, I wanted to say, how much more will God give you anything that I, that, that I ask? Jesus gave us a specific and better answer, and it's the Holy Spirit. You know, God had promised to his people. The Spirit. Ezekiel 36, 26, uh, 27. Some of you guys know this. And I will give you a new heart and, and a new spirit I will put, uh, uh, put within you. And I will move the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of uh, 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 flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statue and be careful to obey my rules. Then in Joel chapter 2, we see that it, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour my spirit, capital S, on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men uh, shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Right? And this long-awaited prophecy is answered in, cha in Acts chapter 2. And it's exactly what the disciples desperately needed at Pentecost, where the spirit pours out. And they are filled and, and, filled, and dwelt and filled with the spirit. Now, we don't need, a, we don't, as New Testament believers, we don't need to pray for the indwelling of the Spirit if we are believers. Romans 8 9 says, it, however, are, are you not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit? Indeed, the Spirit of God lives in you. Ephesians 1 13. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed and you were marked with. Uh, marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. We have the indwelling of the Spirit when we put our faith in Christ. We should pray, though, that we are filled and controlled by the Spirit. We should pray that the Spirit would produce fruit in our lives uh, that pleases God and satisfies our souls. We should pray that the Spirit would produce God's love and joy and peace and patience in our lives. We should pray that God would satisfy us with himself. That he would make do on his promise that when we open our mouths wide, he will fill it. We should pray that he would make us like that tree planted by the river of water producing fruit and is stable and flourishing despite our circumstances. We should pray with boldness and confidence that God would break our hearts and do a great work in us that we understand his love more and love others more. Some of you may be are spiritually dry. And maybe you've been like that for a while. You're in a season of life where you just don't feel like praying. You don't feel like we're spending time with Jesus. Other things are more important. How often have you ran to God about your spiritual state? God's heart is that your affections are stirred for him. And he will answer you if you seek him. Pray, God, you said... You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and your right hand there is pleasures evermore. Lord, help me to experience what your word says, what the psalmist is saying right here. You said, delight myself in the Lord. Help me to delight in you, find my satisfaction in you. You said, the afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. Some of you need to pray Paul's prayers, right? That when he prayed uh, for others, but you could pray for yourself that you would understand the love of God more. Many of you need that. When Paul prays in Romans 5, 13, 15, 13, he says, Make the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. You need to pray that for yourself. No matter how you feel, how far you are from God, you, if you are his child, the Spirit of God lives in you. 
And God lives in you, and he, he, he can and will increase your love and affection for him. Keep praying and expecting God to answer. Keep praying for God to, for you to experience more relational knowledge and more experience of his presence. That is what you need most in your life, no matter what. Some of us are, who are going through trials... Yes, we need to pray that God can remove that trial, but what you need most in the removal of that trial is more of Jesus, more of God, right? Ask yourself, would you rather have that trial removed or more of God himself? Again, you should pray that God removed the trial. That's, that's right to pray. But what we need more than this removed from our life or this put in our life or this situation changed is God, right? The Father's presence and intimacy in our lives. The experience of him. Don't allow yourself to get in this spiritual strut and just make excuses of why you are where you are. It should scare you if you don't care. Don't blame circumstances. Run to God boldly, consistently to change your affection as you experience more of him. Guess what? He will answer. Some of you do need the praying for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because you, you, you haven't put your faith in Christ. So the Spirit of God doesn't live in you unless you have put your faith in Jesus. Has there been a time in your life where you repented and put your faith in Christ? When that happens, when you come to him, he will in no wise cast out, and the spirit of God lives in you. you that's how you know that you are a child of God. The spirit testifies with their spirit that you are a child of God. Taking this passage as a whole, we see that Jesus answers why we should persevere boldly in prayers to our Father. The passage teaches us that because God is our loving Father who loves to answer the prayers of his children, we must confidently keep running to him in prayer. Because God is our loving Father who loves to answer the prayers of his children, we must confidently keep running to him in prayer. Again, this, even in the language that Jesus uses, this is not just a one-time thing. This is a lifestyle. This is a pattern of life. This is a habit of life. So again, Think with me about this text. What is the basis of motivation that Jesus gives his disciples to keep praying? What is the driving motivator Jesus gives his disciples to keep praying to the Father? The motivation Jesus has is based on the character of God, right? His disposition towards them. He motivates his disciples to keep praying in faith because of who the Father is. Church, are you consumed with God's heart and affection towards you? That will motivate you to keep praying. Again, that is why Paul prays, uh, prays uh, uh, in Ephesians. He says, from, uh, <coughs> says uh, for this reason I kneel before the Father, from, uh, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being through the Spirit. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray, being rooted, I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend, understand, right? With all the saints, what is the length and width and height of the depth of God's love? To know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Church, we need that. When you embrace God's heart for you, you are filled with the knowledge of who he is. Guess what? It's going to motivate you to keep knocking on the door, keep coming to him in prayer, because you know it's a gracious, loving, caring God who desires to answer you is at the other side. That's going to motivate your persistence. So many verses about his heart and his ability to answer prayer to, uh, of his people. Psalm 55, 22, cast your burden on the Lord, and what? He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. 1 Peter 3, 12, for the eyes of the Lord on the righteous and his ears are what? Open to their prayer, to their cry. He says later in, uh, in 1 Peter, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Y'all believe that? Psalm 145, 18, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call up upon him in truth. 
God wants to answer you. He loves to. It's not just a job. No, he's excited to answer the prayers of his people. You, how excited are you to give something to a loved one and see their reaction, right? And sometimes those loved ones get in your nerves half the time, you know? God is that much more infinitely more excited to answer you. You cannot overstate, no elegant master poet can overstate the love and affection for God for his people. There's nothing in the language at all can overstate what God, God's affection for us. Have you lost hope in prayer? If we stop praying for something in discouragement, could it be we need to remind ourselves more of God's character, his disposition towards us. Not just his children as a whole, but his, listen, his love for you. God loves, listen, and is passionate, not just about all God's children. No, he's passionate for you. Make it personal. He sent his son to die for you. Sometimes we think, you know, some people, we can't think that God is more desirous to hear the prayers of somebody we think is more spiritual than us, than, than we are, than uh, to hear us, because we fail often. We sin all the time. Do you think God was more desirous to hear the answer and answer the prayers of the Apostle Paul or Spurgeon or some great tr Christian you know, than he's more desirous to hear you and answer your prayer? You may think, man, I fail and I sin often at the same thing, right? Of course God will answer and hear these great Christians more. Listen, you, miss, you greatly misunderstand the gospel and how God sees you because of what Christ has done on your behalf. His desire to hear your prayer and answer your prayer is not based upon your performance or how spiritual you feel. There's not a spirituality test that makes God's heart and desire to hear your prayer change. No, his... his his desire and affection and, and desire to hear you and answer you is based that you are his child and he spared not his own son to freely give you all things. Church, some of you have family members that need to be saved and maybe they are ant very anti-God and you just have stopped praying for them consistently. Why is that? God wants to save them more than you want them to be saved. Keep running to them. Some of you have maybe wayward kids or, or siblings, right? And they're away from the Lord. And naturally looking, it looks like they're never going to come back to the Lord because of the life of sin they're in. And you just have stopped. Listen, you have stopped consistently praying for that person. Ask yourself, why is that? People are dying, going to hell. People are struggling spiritually. And we look at their circumstances and hard, and we just stop praying consistently. We pray every now and then, but there's not that fervency of prayer. Why is that? Could it be that we are not understanding the heart of God like we should? That we are not convinced of his love for us and his love for that person? When, you when you're praying for this church, for revival... You know, we're in, a, we're in a community that is constantly in flux. You know, they're here today, they're gone, all stuff going around. Are we, do, we, do, we, do we get discouraged in our prayers that God can do a revival and grow and, and make this a spiritual greenhouse for this community and for us? Keep praying. Don't give up. Look at who your God is and let that motivate your prayer. God is a caring, loving Father. If that reality is true, let us run boldly, consistently, and faithfully to him in prayer.